welcome to Equip to Homeschool. I am so excited to have Vicki Bentley here. She works for HSLDA. She's got so much experience under her belt of helping moms and homeschooling so many children. So I cannot wait to give you the insight and the resources that she has to share with us. Vicki, welcome. Welcome to this event. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate it, Maggie. Thanks for having me. I would love if you would just start off, first of all, and just tell us a little bit about your backstory. Like, what is your experience with homeschooling? What has brought you to this place that you're in right now? Okay. It's a long one. <laughs> My husband and I started homeschooling our kiddos back in the 80s, back when most people wouldn't sell to us. Um, I started homeschooling by uh, ordering my material from the back of a women's magazine. <laughs> so I had a correspondence course for my kiddos. I had met one lady a couple of states over about two years earlier who had some, um, some I shouldn't say, I don't know if I could say the brand, had a, a private school textbook underneath the stroller. It was kind oh of, uh, what do they call that? Um, contraband, I guess. Yes. <laughs> And so th that was how I got interested in homeschooling. And so we started homeschooling back in the 80s, um, ended up changing states, homeschooled later on, homeschooled you know, many of our other children. My oldest four daughters were not homeschooled because we didn't know about homeschooling back then, but the younger four were homeschooled and then we homeschooled um, uh, many of our foster kids as well. So, and uh, I've just been blessed to be part of some great homeschooling communities along the way. I've uh, been a support group leader for a while. And um, now I am blessed to be able to uh, encourage other moms, help encourage and equip other moms, other families on their homeschool journey through my work with Homeschool Legal Defense Association or HSLDA. So I'm one of the education consultants there. Oh, we love HSLDA. We've used it for our whole journey. It has been such a blessing and I'm so glad we have that resource available and how awesome that they, that they got you. I mean, really, that's what's such a treat that they actually have the privilege of having you, which is so awesome. Not a and great team, so. <laughs> well, they're a great team. We have a good team. Well, a lot of people don't know that HSLDA has educational consultants. We've got um, 14 gals on staff right now, everything from preschool through high school, plus special needs and struggling learners. So awesome. That is such a great tool. Oh, and so you can go access that mom. I mean, seriously, just even right off the bat right now to hslda.org to find consultants and get help. And also to have that back, you know, that backing, knowing that we're supported as homeschoolers in this country is just phenomenal, you know, with the lawyers and all of the different aspects of this that really can help us put the fears that we may have about homeschooling at bay, knowing that there are those experts on our team taking care of that has just made the freedom to homeschool even more powerful, I think, as a homeschool as well in a state like ours where I'm in California. So you know, we just love knowing that we have that in our hip pocket. So, all right. So aside from that though, we're really going to focus a little bit on kind of how to do this budget friendly, right? So a lot of homeschoolers are starting. We have the gamut of the lifestyles of people who are beginning to homeschool and really not knowing how to do this without spending thousands and thousands of dollars. I mean, you and I both, we've homeschooled multiple children at one time, right? And so the first thing I know that um, that I normally tell people is to be careful not to jump in and assume that you need to buy a whole set of curriculum for every age and every grade of every child. That's the biggest public school misnomer, I think, and myth that people have, right? They need to break through. What do you have to say about that? Do you agree? I think that's, that's a great suggestion because when we start homeschooling, you and I only know to do what we did. And for most of us, that's gonna be a conventional school experience. And so our tendency is to try to recreate school at home. And homeschooling is just so much, or home education, however you wanna term it, is so much bigger than school at home. It's creating a lifestyle of learning for our, our children. It's, um, when we first start out, I think we have to kind of de-school a little bit, not just our kids, but but ourselves and we have to uh, we have to come to that understanding i think in at least for me it was a big help to recognize that my goal isn't to recreate school at home but to become a facilitator of learning for my kids now obviously that meant i'm going to have to you know work on being purposeful about getting some skills into them and those basic skills and then uh, give them lots of opportunities to build on those skills but that doesn't have to cost a fortune i've got um, um an article on my website. HSLDA has some great articles as well at hslda.org. Um, I've gone into a little bit more detail in a few of my articles at Everyday Homemaking. 
dot com that will kind of expand on some of the HSLDA articles, if that's of any help. And so I have an article at Everyday Homemaking called, um, what does it cost to homeschool? Because I think it's really important for us to count the cost, to recognize some of the hidden expenses that could be there uh, and evaluate um, maybe um, what this is going to cost. How can we cut down some things there? But, you know, you can homeschool with just a library card. You can spend thousands of dollars if you want, or you can get a library card. And Literally. Do everything. Most people will probably do something in between. Most people feel more comfortable having at least math and language arts covered uh, in a little bit more structured way because those are skills subjects than the typical parent um, just starting out in, uh, especially will probably feel more comfortable having some kind of guideline, whether it's a textbook, workbook, or even a scope and sequence or skills checklist that would show what does the typical student cover in this grade level in math and language, the skills subjects. How you cover that is totally up to you. I, I'll give you an example, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to ramble, but um, to give you an example, uh, let's say uh, you're covering division. Maybe it says on a, on a skills checklist that the average student of this level would probably cover the concept of division. One family will do that with a, a textbook. Another family will choose to cover their math with a correspondence program or a distance learning program. Another will hire a tutor. Somebody else will break out a bag of M&Ms. Yep. So how you accomplish that is totally up to your family's personality, your family's dynamics. But the key is you're going to cover the subjects because you're a great parent and you want to provide a well-rounded program of study for your kids. So Yes, I love that. And, you know, so they're, sorry, <laughs> no, no, that's a great example because you're right. I love the gamut of things you just suggested because all the way from I would say like one of them's going to just start cooking. Right. They're just going to grab their kid and say, all right, how many are we making this for? How You know, you deal with. So there's so many different ways to incorporate through action and through activity subjects that we're so used to feeling have to be pencil, paper, book learning, and we can create that environment for them in so many different ways. And a lot of a lot of the issue, and I really believe the hang up for so many moms too, is the validity of that non-paper method. If you choose one that, and, and actually that might work better for your child, that's more action oriented, experiential, but the, the, the hang up that most people will have is owning the confidence and the belief that that's good, that that's enough and okay, even if it's not measurable on the typical world scale of a child writing at that time. It doesn't mean that they won't eventually, that this is just a piece of the puzzle of the journey they're on, that they're able to take these pieces and that as they get older, they'll be able to, you know, formulate the equation written eventually, but they get the concept without that. I saw a little meme not long ago, and I, I'll probably get it wrong, but it was something along the lines of, aren't you afraid your child will be behind? And the, and the answer was, behind what? Yes. You know, every child has their own, um, uh, their own maturity rate. Now, obviously, as conscientious parents, we're kind of double check here that there aren't anything aren't any learning glitches that might be causing an issue but you know God made children to be curious yeah. and they're curious and they learn um, just instinctively and automatically but we also need to remember especially with our younger kids from preschool all the way up to even first or second grade their play is their learning their play is their work we look at it and we think all he's doing is building Legos all she's doing is you know, sorting the, the toys in the playroom, but that's teaching them skills. I mean, when your kiddo is uh, working puzzles, that's visual discrimination, which is a pre-reading skill. When your four-year-old is helping you set the table, that's one-to-one -one correspondence, which is a math skill. When your kids are helping you tidy up the playroom and they're sorting the matchbox cars from the Legos, from the, you know, the puzzle pieces or whatever, that's sorting and classification and organization, which are math and science and language arts skills. So we feel like if it's not sitting down at a table and working in a workbook, it doesn't count. But if your kids, if you were paying big bucks to send your child to, let's say, a Montessori school, they'd be doing the same things you're doing with your kids. <laughs> that you're paying for it. <laughs> the key is just being purposeful. 
yeah. I like to ask parents, if nobody told you when your child turned five or six or whatever it is that he has to go to school, what would you be doing with him? Because you've homeschooled from the beginning. That's you were right. already homeschooling to start with, and you probably weren't really worried about lesson plans. You, you did things as life brought the lessons along. And so I like to think of it as when your child turns five or six, how can you take your family's personality? How can you take your family dynamics and who you are as a family and be more purposeful in that? So I love that. No, it's so true. And also just being aware of what's, what's just the next level. What's the next thing you can tell you and you listen to your children, you see that they, they're either bored with something or they're kind of done with it. Well, how can we tweak it? How can we do something just a little differently to keep that interest and that curiosity? I love how you mentioned all the different, even physical skills and activities between linking things and stringing beads and all the things we've done with our little ones just to occupy them. It's not to occupy them. It's to ignite their brain, right? It's to create something in them. Same with sandbox play. These are all their spatial awareness things going on developmentally in their whole being of a person that they need for that mental ability to, you know, such a tiny, tiny amount of time is spent in the actual cognitive awareness of maybe the writing. Right. There's so much else going on in their whole being that's helping create their way to think. Lots of brain connections going on. So yeah, yeah, and it's so, so helpful. So um, let's talk and just share some even more. This is like a really practical time of tricks and ideas. I love what you said about the library and um, and about our curriculum and how to do this on a shoestring because I had a girlfriend once, one year, she just up and decided, we're like, you know what? I'm gonna use a Bible and my library card this year and that's it. Like it was almost taken as a challenge just for fun. And you can do this. Like it's such a great activity to be able to, create your own set of curriculum, make it meet the needs of all your children. Tell us more about that. I know that you've done things like this before, so I'd love to hear. Sure. Well, most people, Maggie, who are concerned about the expense probably have more than one child. I'm not saying you aren't concerned about it if you only have one, but it usually becomes a bigger issue when you're dealing with multiple kiddos. And so what I like to remind parents is that, um, as we said before, math and language arts are skills subjects. And as you so wonderfully pointed out, it's really a continuum. Don't worry about grade level, worry about mastery level, what That's comes right. next. So, but for math and language, most people are gonna wanna do something purposeful, um, probably slightly structured, to, at least to some degree, just because most of us feel more comfortable with that. Even if it means as a relaxed homeschooler, you have a checklist of skills and then you decide from, you know, internet searches how you want to cover those. Um, I have an article on my website called What Should I Be Teaching My Child? And at the end of the article, I have um, a handful of those scope and sequence checklists that can give parents an idea. Like I said, even if you don't want to use textbooks, having an idea of what concepts might come next in math and language can be helpful. And then you can be a little bit more purposeful in introducing those um, or having opportunities. But uh, if you used to say a math and language arts program of some sort. There are some really budget friendly ones. There's some free reading programs. There's math programs that range from kind of do it yourself to maybe 40 or $50. Most people are probably going to spend roughly around $75 for a math program. Um, and then maybe between 45 and hundred dollars on a language arts program. I like can I, can I list brand names? Um, I know. I don't know. I haven't even gone there yet. <laughs> I have so many that are my favorites, but yeah, go for it. One of my favorites, at least for people to start looking at to get a sense of what's available, is learning language arts through literature. And the reason I like that program is, first of all, it's really budget friendly. It's about $40. It's non-consumable, so you can save it for the next kiddo, but it's got all of your language arts in it. So it's got... Um, Instead of having a separate grammar program and reading program and spelling program and composition, it's all in one book. So you're getting all of that for $40. It's lesson planned out for you, simple to use. So it's one of my favorites, at least to start taking a peek at. Um, and so it uh, doesn't have to cost a lot. And again, one of the, um, the key components to saving money here is being able to reuse some of the material if you can for other kids. Yeah. So that is a non-consumable, meaning you're not gonna use it up and you can use it for another child later on. But um, where were we going with that? So well, yeah, using the different programs. I mean, so yes. we talked a little bit of math and a little bit of language arts. Um, I know that uh, over the years with 11 kids, I've used 
several different ones to see which method is going to work out best. So don't be aware, be aware that the one program, if it's not really clicking with your child, that's okay. You know, but, I know that for less than 30 bucks, I think I picked up a teach your child to read in a hundred easy lessons. I mean, that was a no brainer. Right. One of the kids that was easy, but I did find that there was a lot of gaps and a lot of holes in their, you know, their actual phonics awareness, but that we filled, but, but there's always going to be holes. And then there's other, I mean, we could list a thousand different programs right now, but I know I personally have kind of settled into more of a um, all about reading approach. I've really enjoyed that. I feel like that's been helpful for my kids, my younger ones as we've gone through that's filled in and had a lot less holes now. But um, but you know what, like I said, that same child, you know, who learned through the gap approach, <laughs> very gappy, still is an English major today. So clearly that's not something that was a problem and magna cum laude. So I'm sure that it's, it's all, that's the thing. Whatever the Lord provides you at that moment, do your best with what you've got, do what you can, and then go ahead and don't be married to it. So to speak, but you know, tweak it if you need to. And, right. and I think it's, go ahead. Saying, there's a lot that are in it. I was just, I was sharing it because it's $40 for all right, of life. Right, right. So there are other programs that obviously that are excellent. There's a bunch of inexpensive ones. We've got them listed for you in a variety of places. But the key here, when we talk about saving money on your curriculum, most people are going to want a math and language, but then for your science and social studies, um, you can either use a textbook if you want, or you can go to one of those lists of what do most kids cover sometime between kindergarten and eighth grade and yep. just do what's of interest to your family. But the key is instead of having a, a program of study for science and social studies for every one of your 11 children, you yep. probably discovered that it's a, a lot simpler to just at least in our family, pick what I wanted the oldest child to do that I was working with in science and social studies, the non-skills subjects. And whatever the oldest child does, everybody's doing the same topic. We're going to hit it at a different level for each of them. The expectations I have of them are going to be different, but we can all cover the same topic. So maybe you're more comfortable with a textbook. So buy one textbook instead of 11 textbooks, you buy one textbook for that oldest child. And it can even be an older version of the textbook because you're not needing all of the parts and pieces to coordinate. So let's say you'd get one textbook um, for we'll say science and you use that as your springboard for everybody else. You're gonna go through maybe uh, the table of contents and that'll give you the topic that you wanna cover. And then you could um, go through the chapter and say, okay, what are some of the vocabulary lists or bold faced words? And that becomes your vocabulary. Are there people that they list that you can use as read alouds um, and you know, read a biography of somebody? Are there projects and things listed? The juvenile section of the library is my best friend. You know, yeah. Go to the juvenile section of the library and find everything you can find on that topic that can hit the other levels. So I'm teaching to the level of the oldest child that I'm working with and everybody else is basically riding the mental bus to their own mental bus stop. And then they hop off the bus yeah, and I always yeah. say, and you'll know they've hopped off the bus, but, uh, but your younger kids are going to learn so much more than you even imagined they could learn because you're teaching them at a teaching, presenting information to them at a higher level. And when I say teaching, I'm not talking about having to sit down with your kids and have a one-room schoolhouse. I just mean having the information available and the opportunities available. So I agree. I think I think having the vocabulary of the older child, that's part of it. The fact that you're even speaking in a way that is above their level. Um, it's amazing how children will rise. They will always rise. They rise to the highest, not the lowest common denominator. You know, I think in our current school system, the reason why with, you know, everyone at the same age, they are, they're all leveled out. They're not really inspired to go higher. They don't see that person, you know, struggling with their science or with their math concepts or whatever. And, and it's just kind of like, eh, you know, this like placid place, but now you know, with this teaching to the older, I've definitely done that. And, you know, having experienced doing this so many years, I liked actually sometimes 
well, first of all, I, the older's needs were met, but at the same time, I sometimes would go to the a middle kid, for instance, if I felt like there was something that I've overlooked, you know, because we're going to repeat. We often repeat things. And especially when you have multiple age children, you're going to repeat. So don't feel bad about that. Even the older kid getting it again in a new way, they were a certain age when they heard it the first time. So right. when they hear it again as an older kid, that younger one came up and they heard it for the first time. And yet this older kid's hearing it a second second time, which is even more powerful. So don't be afraid to repeat. I was going to say something about, oh, when you were talking about the non like skills based, I kind of call them developmental based as well, because it doesn't matter. It is skills based approach. And so it doesn't matter how old you are. If you don't know that next thing, if you don't know phonics and you don't know spelling or you don't know that math skill, all you're going to do is learn it. You could be in college and take remedial math. That's just a fact. So we'll all get it when we get it. So as long as we're feeding them and constantly setting the table, then we are doing our diligence as parents and as teachers to give them that opportunity to learn. Um, but I want to go back to the scope and sequence and the power of having those. Most times I notice too that curriculum companies have their own. So okay. being aware of that, yes. um, I would encourage all of you to get to like pick and choose uh, several. Don't right. just take one because they will often teach to their bent of how they wrote their program. And right. that way you can see that myriad of, of, you know, variety in how they go. Well, fourth graders don't always have to have that particular thing and hold them very loosely. Like yes. I said, this is just to give you an idea. Yeah, sprinkle. Some people you just say, I have no clue what a typical fourth grader might learn. You may look at this list and you might say, oh, they say a fourth grader would normally learn these things. Well, you know what? She already knows this and she already knows this. And, you know, we're going to do this later. I don't think we need to do this now or <clears throat> cross it up. I don't think anybody should have to learn that one. That's okay. It's just to give you a, a guideline so that you don't go through life and then discover, oh my goodness, I would have never thought to bring that up to my kids, but hold it really loosely. And, the, and as you mentioned, all of the publishers have one because it's the scope and sequence is the scope is what is covered. The sequence is in what order. So every publisher has one of those so that you know what their material covers. But I've also listed some for you that aren't connected to a particular curriculum. Mm. Uh, there's uh, uh, there's a, a book, there's uh, some online lists and things like that that are not attached to particular curriculum providers yeah. um, as well as some curriculum ones. But again, just hold them really loosely. Please don't be in bondage to these lists. And I'm really only looking at the skills subjects of math and language as far as being concerned about any order. For the other ones, which I like to think of as content-based subjects, I just look at it as a menu from sometime between kindergarten and eighth grade, I probably want to consider introducing these things to my kids. And almost all of them are things they're going to hit again in high school. So yeah. And if you have all those ages and you're new and you're seeing your high schooler going, I don't know what they learned or what they did it. Don't worry about it. Just start where you are and kind of talk to them. I think that's a run, one really cool thing to, to do, especially if you're pulling, especially in this day and age, those moms who are new to homeschooling and you literally are like, I'm over the Zoom thing. I'm over all these other ways that this is happening. And you know, there's something better for your kid. I want to really encourage you that, especially because this isn't something that you're necessarily been saturated with, that, that you can just be okay with where they are right now. And as a matter of fact, talk to them they know what they remember and what they don't. And so you can have that dialogue and that fun conversation to say, hey, what is it that you want to know about? I often do this with my junior and seniors when I've homeschooled them all the way through. I go, hey, we got two years left. Where do you feel like you're missing out? Is there some subject? Is there some historical period that you feel like we went could have gone deeper in? That's the cool part. If you get them enrolled and engaged in what they're going to learn, they're going to take so much more from it because they'll, they'll be interested and excited. And then you guys together, can do that discovery of go what what book can we read about this what biography like you said it doesn't always have to be a textbook approach although having that backbone that little you know structure of there of a sequence of some kind is fine um, but don't be afraid to deviate from it if you see the subject matter of that topic is Hitler for instance you can go read a book about Hitler and skip that chapter and read that instead I mean there's decisions you can make where you have the structure but again you're not married to it, just like you were saying, like, don't hold them so tightly. Even the textbook isn't the master. Right. Right. So, yeah. So 
So what other insights would you give um, and creativity do you have? Um, I don't know, especially with, I know math, like we said, those skills-based ones, we're going to want to have some kind of a resource. I mean, that could be as simple as going to Costco and picking up a notebook, right? Or it could be what? You mean for saving pages? Yeah, for saving money, like printing out pages from the internet or... I do want to... caution parents to be careful when they're picking up those workbooks at some of the stores. Some of them are designed to be supplements to what the student is already learning. And so if you don't have a way to purposefully present the new concepts to the student, um, they can reach a point where they are having trouble staying on top of it themselves. Sometimes when they're younger and it's very basic, then Um, They can kind of fill in the gaps, but as the math levels get a little harder, it's important that you've got some method for them to be learning the new material, whether it's a video that they're watching or a textbook or workbook that you're going through or however you're handling it. But um, some of the things that you would buy are designed to be practice work for what they're supposed to be already learning um, in another environment. So just make sure. I agree. And I think what's really cool, and just I want to give that encouragement to parents that where we're going to find the most um, expense cutting is, like we said, in the library. And therefore, if you prioritize those subjects that do require and would be, it would be important to have a baseline can reusable like the writing program or the language arts program let's say phonics teaching a child to read and then teaching them to do math are the two key p- components if that's where any of your money was most of your money was spent the rest can be completely created on your own don't you agree yeah and like you mentioned those subjects math and lang- uh, math and language like we said i'm going to keep reiterating those skill subjects yes Language arts is more than reading. There's a language portion, there's an understanding, there's a logic, there's a, when you read to your child and you say, why do you think he did that? Or what do you think is gonna happen next? There's a lot more to it. But um, there's a little tiny book by Ruth Beachick called The Three R's of Learning. It's like $12 or 15 at the most. And if you had something along those lines, it would guide you through putting together your own math program, your own reading program, and your own language study for kindergarten to third grade-ish for 15 bucks. So again, doesn't have to cost a lot. You're gonna spend more, the more uh, involved instruction you get from somebody else. So the more guidance you're getting, the more oversight you're getting, the more teacher support you're getting, obviously you're gonna be paying for that. But for parents who feel confident, you know what, I could do this if somebody just gave me an idea of what to cover and walked me through it, something along those lines can be really inexpensive. See, now that's a wonderful resource because I, th- I found when I started out as homeschooling as well, 25 years ago, you know, we were on the, we were in the upswing of more, more options, more opportunities between that and 10 years prior when you got started and my mom got started as well with my sister, where, you know, I love that. Those, oh, show them. Those They're, are the three are. R's. They are this little. It's actually put together now. This is the original version. They've compiled them. All. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. I have those. I love it. That's why I'm saying I love this. On my floor. They compiled these into one little book, but you can see this is how they're stapled together. They're that thin. So anyway, sorry. No, but that is so key. The reason why I love that you brought that up is because mom, we are equipping ourselves first. When we equip ourselves, we're, we're the first one who took the initiative to choose to bring our kids home and then, or husband, whatever, the couple. And then when we get to this though, we get to do our own self-education. We get to create this atmosphere of learning. And that is a perfect tool. We've talked in another, uh, several other conversations about the idea of what does your homeschool want to look like? And we talked about for the children's sake and how, how important it is to even and just discover the atmosphere of learning. Well, this next step is the practical, super duper practical. How do I kit, equip my mind? I can teach any child third grade and under all these subjects so simply with those simple tools. And the other thing I'm looking at as I'm choosing material is there's material that's designed to be learned and there's material that's designed to be taught. And when my children are very young and they're not reading on their own yet, whatever level that may be, some kids don't read till they're eight, some kids read when they're four, whatever. Um, When I'm working with those kiddos who aren't reading yet, obviously there's going to be a lot more of the me time involved. But once my kids can read fluently on their own, 
I'm trying to work into as much self-guided material as possible to give them some ownership of their own learning. Um, and I'm going to try to work myself out of a job and more into the role of coach. Doesn't mean I'm going to, you know, like run off to the mall or something while they're doing schoolwork, but, but, you know, I can actually maybe go start lunch or something. Um, but as I'm looking at the material, I'm looking for things for my readers that are more uh, self-instructional for them. Uh, and again, a lot of those hopefully are going to be things that are reusable so I can save money in the long run. So Yeah, I did find, find, especially with, I had early and late readers, right, on the spectrum throughout that whole time. And because of that, my mommy time was definitely higher with those that need okay. more instruction, but also the, the delegating of the reading aloud to those who can read and kind of helping with some of that journey. But um. But I, I like what you said about how we all need to um, that train our kids as, as they develop that ownership. They're going to own their own education. And so as they do develop the reading, um, the questions that you asked and you mentioned in the language arts, for instance, that, com that inquisitiveness, that conversation that encompasses more of what language arts is about, that still can be done with any subject. You can be reading a history book and do that conversation and draw out the language and the information and that 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 comprehension, correct? Like it, it's amazing how, and I think that's why your learning language arts through literature is key because that's exactly the point. We can right. read any book and we draw language arts into it by talking about the language, by talking about ask, did you understand what they said there? And um, did you hear how they, like, that sentence was structured? Listen to how beautiful it was. Or, you know, all of these things we can draw out of any, any book. But see, we as mom may not think to ourselves to ask those questions or to draw it out. Maybe just the rote speaking of it all. It'll, they'll get something. But be aware as we continue on this journey to begin to learn ourselves how to ask good questions. I love the example that you gave there. Um, Sandy Queen at Queen Homeschool has a series called Language Lessons for Little Ones, I believe. Yep. And uh, when I first picked up one of the younger level ones, it was fascinating to see that a lot of the lessons were that type of thing where there's a there's an art piece and like a, sure. yeah, that's a classic a classic study. art and then maybe you're talking about it. You know, uh, what colors do you see in here? And you, all of these, you're just talking about this piece of art but you're drawing your child into it and I thought those are things that a lot of moms kind of do intuitively but a lot of other moms for another a lot of other moms it's not intuitive it's not instinctive and so having somebody guide them through the kinds of questions the kinds of insights to look for can be really helpful and I again agree. Expensive. especially with that mom is so tired you're sitting here nursing you've changed a diaper the two-year-old just you know spilled their milk and you're like tell Don't me what question me. to ask please <laughs> i do not know what to ask them you know so i i totally am with you in that i've i've been there done that and so it is such a beautiful prompt to have and i would see i love queen publishers i, I, I had several of her books and so as i remember doing that with the little ones and going oh how lovely, how cute to just sit up and talk about this pretty picture of that child holding a kitty cat, you know, and asking them, is it cold outside or warm outside? You know, we do this. I know another another curriculum that's super fun and very reusable is, um, I'm just thinking of it right now, especially for new moms who have younger ones, um, five in a row, five in a row. One of my favorites, yeah. One very of my favorite. favorite, right? Because it's such a gentle way to get started as a homeschooler of just read a picture book every day and draw something else out of it. Well, and I think that goes back to what we talked to at the beginning. I, I, I love five in a row. It didn't exist when my kids were younger, or I probably would have, I'm sure I would have used it. Um, they've done a fabulous job with it. But remember we said, if you have your math and your language and your library card, and this is perfect, your math and your language and five in a row is a guide to your library books if you don't know what to cover. And it's again, taking what most of us are probably already doing with our kids, reading to them classic kids books, and making it more purposeful. So, you know, for about $35, you get a guidebook that gives you a suggestion of Caldecott and Newbery award-winning books. You pick those up at the library, you read the book to your kiddo five days in a row, because you're going to be reading it to them every day anyway. And you just pick from their menu of suggestions, you pick uh, um, an activity to do each day from a different school subject. So one day you might um, do something that's history-based. The next day might be science-based. 
might be language based, but it doesn't feel like school to them because nope. it's just we read our fun book together and then we did something. So it's a great, uh, a great program to. Um, yeah. To yeah. Bring. Like, and before five in a row was great too, because that's that earlier stage, right when that child, I mean, how many of you mamas, it's like my, my little granddaughter, she's constantly right now going on a bear hunt is like the book of the century. And so it's memorized. You could read it 25 times a day because that's what they need. They want that rote consistency. And so this brings a whole new level of what to do with that, that they're going to bring it to you every day anyway. So you want to, if you want to grab, make way for the ducklings or lay, you know, lentil, and you read that story. Well, now it inspires you as a mom to see something different yourself. See, sometimes we get so sick of seeing the same thing, but we don't think to ourselves, well, let's talk about Central Park. Anybody want to find where it is on a map? I mean, we can do all sorts of cool things about learning, you know, was this true? Is this pretend? You know, all these different things you can learn um, by using just even picture books and picture books can count as school too, which I love because yeah, our crux of so many years has been multiple picture books because they're so rich and full of good literature and good writing and I don't know, just super fun for the kids. I think sometimes we just need as parents, we just need the inspiration and, and sometimes you're just tired. And like you said, somebody can just give me the suggestions of things to do, which can be really helpful there. Another one for uh, ages about five to eight ish would be or even a little bit younger up to around eight ish would be a year of playing skillfully again buy it one time and you can use it for several years with multiple ages of kids um, and it's going to encompass a, a lot of different subject areas so there's a lot of um, and we've just mentioned a couple here there are tons and tons that's what I do with HSLDA is I talk to parents uh, our member families who call in and I try to get a sense of who their family is what might be a good fit for them um, there's a lot of other ways that you can cut costs or uh, save money in your um, in your homeschooling. Taking advantage of community resources. You mentioned the library, but there's a lot of other things. There are field trips your kids can go on. Um, the local businesses. Now I know right now is kind of an iffy time. Um, there's a lot going on in the world right now that may keep us from um, being quite as involved as usual, but the TV station and the local farm and your doctor's office and the chiropractor and uh, the pizzeria, the, our local pizza place would do classes for the kids, little sessions where the kids could come in and before they opened and they would show them how pizzas are made and they'd make their own pizzas and, you know, going to the newspaper, um, the grocery store often will have a nutritionist who will do classes for your kids. So there's a lot of opportunities for your kids to learn things inexpensively or free in the context of your own community. So. I love that. It's so true. And so really encouraging you to get involved. In, and if you don't have a, a homeschooling group of some kind of support group within your community, start one, do your own, start your own, start reaching out, finding out who are the homeschoolers in your area who are independently homeschooling and kind of in this journey that, that maybe they're not, you know, they're not within a public school setting at all. And they're like you who don't have those other resources. And so it's so neat to, to bond together. Those are ways that we can create more opportunities and creativity in the actions that we do. One of our families recently like did a whole, you know, um, nature walk down Carpinteria Beach and got to see tar pits and go see all of the sand, you know, creatures as the tide went out and, you know, go tide pooling. So there's sometimes you can do this as a group and a mom might have a passion for it and invite 10 extra kids along. That's, That's like, right. yay, let's do that. <laughs> You're already doing it. I have an article on the website at Everyday Homemaking called um, Creating Your Own Opportunities. And it's exactly that kind of thing. It doesn't have to be a long-term commitment. It doesn't mean you have to set up a class every week for the next year. It's like you said, just being purposeful. We're going to, you know, this is what we're studying and we want to go on this trip. Hey, we can get a group rate. I mean, you probably got a group rate just with your family. Yeah, just with us. And, you know, my husband, we used to laugh because they would give my husband the bus discount when we went to Wendy's, but yes. the bus driver discount. Um, but it may, you may find that just your family and one other family qualify for a group rate. And so you can, you know, you can kind of kill two birds with one stone because you're learning things and you're providing that social opportunity for your kids as well, if that's important to you. So, yeah, yeah. so I definitely agree that having, having our social, um, just even a, a homeschool support group where you can get together and create those different, you know, openings for each other. And I like your, when you're talking about field trips too, like there are other ways, um, 
that you can pool together as well that help cut costs. So let's say that when you when you have a network, if you start to get to know other homeschool moms as well, what did they use a year before and they're finished with it? You can start to do some swaps. You can there are online swaps that we can do. There are co-ops that other people have created where you can find many of what we've talked about, the different curriculums and things like that for you know for pennies um, through eBay even different ways that we can get a lot of these costs down. And so that's another resource. And you mentioned connecting with a local support group. By the way, if you don't know a local support group, if you go to HSLDA's website and click on the community tab, you can find some groups uh, and that's a good starting point. If you don't see anything there, find your state organization listed there and check their website because sometimes groups think to list with the state and they don't think to list with us. So check them both. Yeah. But um, so those are some great opportunities to connect. But um, it's you can save a lot of money just on things you're doing together, taking classes and things like that. And I know within my local support group, um, I own a lot of book series. So for example, maybe you like Life of Fred or you like Saxon or you like learning language arts or you like um, you know, excellence in writing or you whatever it might be. Yep. Uh, or essentials in writing, excuse me, I was thinking of Institute for Excellence in Writing. Yes, <laughs> got it. But, but things that are series. Some people own the whole series. And if their child isn't using that year right now, they may be fine with lending it to you or renting it to you for a very low price. They just like to get it back in usable condition. I mean, I own whole series of things. And if, if I'm not using it this year, you can borrow it in my local group. I just want it back when I need to start it with my kiddo. So mm -hmm. Yes, I'm, I'm becoming that same kind of a resource. My garage is my library and it's like, there you go. Oh, you want my father's world? Here it is. Uh, which year? Which generation? Am I high school? Okay. Let me see which Rubbermaid tub to bring out. So yes. Exactly. Exactly. And I probably will start organizing that way. So, um, so you can, you know, you can develop that as well and take advantage. Oh, by the way, I did it, um, an Instagram on this just, just two days ago because I was visiting my son in Seattle and we went to this beautiful little hideaway village that's gorgeous. They had a bookstore. I went to the back of that bookstore and guess what I found? A tiny little shelf that said used books. And in that shelf, I found five books that were worth purchasing all less than $4. Wow. One of them was Come Look With Me. Two of them were the hardback versions of Come Look With Me, which is, we were talking about um, Stacey Queen, right? Sandy Queen, sorry. And her, you know, picture studies, exact same idea. These gorgeous hardbound books of art, great artists work. And next to that photograph is a list of questions that you can interact with your child and draw from this art appreciation book. So two of them, they're, they're basically teaching children to look at art for the little ones. And so three bucks. And those are normally, I spent 20 bucks on those in real life, you know, way back when. So you can do this at the used bookstores as well. And, and I appreciate what you shared there about using those books and you, you know, correlate it to something else. So many times our parents uh, especially newer families think that they have to go out and buy all of these specifically homeschool books. But I just like to use a lot of what we call living books. If you're familiar with the Charlotte Mason approach, you'll have heard that as well. But living books are just books written by somebody with a passion for the subject who they just want to ignite that passion in your kiddos or, or in the reader. Um, I'm thinking of children here. Yep. And they don't usually say grade one, grade two, grade three on them. They're the things you'd pick up at the library. They're the books you, you know, grab off of Amazon. They're the books that you, you look at and you think, oh, I should get this for his birthday or for Christmas, or he'd probably like this because this is one of his passions right now. And so that's perfect. You know, having those, those art resources. I just picked up a coloring book this week for one of my, one of mine, um, that was, um, it's a coloring book of masterpiece paintings. Mm. So there are some gorgeous ones of those. I have them in my Amazon cart right now. And they have like even special pens and, or pencils that they've already collected together. That like there was one for Van Gogh that I saw that has oh. all the right blues and all the right oranges and stuff just right for that. And you can I'd like to know where that is. So okay. yeah, I'll send you the link afterwards. <laughs> I just found it on Amazon. Um, so they've got some really neat resources like that. So yeah, I love that. And, and finding your children. I know that encyclopedias that your grandparents might have. I mean, there are things that you would have thought, I don't care about that. It's old. It's just, you know, we have the internet now. No, some people still have those old books like that you touch. And uh -huh. here's what's fun. If you <laughs> open up that, that door of interest in your children, if they're interested in dinosaurs, if they're interested in, 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 uh, 
airplanes go find those things and have them like draw them and get tissue paper i mean there are things that you can do and have on hand that are so inexpensive tissue paper for kids to do tracing of maps and drawings and flowers and all those things are just pennies especially if you only buy tissue paper at the grocery store not in the art section but in the food section it's way cheaper when you get those little see-through pieces of paper that you can draw on as long as they're not waxed so there's little tricks and things like that of ways to keep your costs way down even for supplies yeah. so you know be unconventional and you're Speaking of supplies, I know a lot of people right now are really uh, looking for ways to add to their uh, computers in their home because now they got multiple kids. Um, there's an organization called notebooksforstudents.org. Uh, there's another website, pcsforpeople.org. And both of those, I've, I see them at conferences a lot, um, homeschool conferences. So they uh, really like to help homeschoolers to be able to find uh, high quality laptops and desktop computers for budget friendly prices. So you might want to check those out as well. That's great. I know that's a big expense for families. Yeah, that can be for sure. So um, yeah, and I would love it. Maybe you can even share and I'll put in our, um, on your page or in our email, some of those links, you know, to special aid, some of the, your favorites like that. So but uh, wow, so Vicki, you are so amazing. I love all the resources that you've shared with us. I mean, this is gonna be so neat. Moving forward and any mom who has a question also, if you've got some real specifics and you're like, you know, you didn't get you know, my specific situation dealt with, then please reach out to us, send an email to us or even connect with us when we go live in our Facebook group. We're gonna have another conversation and you'll be able to ask us personally and let us know how we can serve you and just ways that we can help you kind of break through and open up your mind to opportunities in different ways about getting creative and making homeschool work for your family and not feeling like, oh, I can't because I don't have. Just go, well, what do you have? And let's make it work. Maggie, can I share something? You mentioned um, personal at the beginning. I want to encourage families who may be watching this today because um, it's really easy to feel that you have to have all of this money to homeschool. My husband was out of work for four years while we homeschooled eight children. And so one year, our total gross income for our family for the year was under $10,000 and we still homeschooled. I've homeschooled for less than $100 a year for my students. Please understand this does not have to cost you a lot of money. You can invest as much as you want, yeah. but it can also be done on a shoestring. I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, same, similar story, out of work. You know, I've homeschooled all the way through nonstop with all the kids from one to 11 now. And we've had years with no job, same thing. And it's like, you know what, where the Lord guides us, he will provide. And he always does. And if it's a conviction from him, he will never leave us without resources because he's the source. And so if we go to him and go, how do you want me to do it? He might say, pick up your library card. Maybe it means the price you have to pay is being a little uncomfortable. Maybe you have to get out of your own way and maybe kind of, right, we can swallow some pride on our own of what we want it to look like and be able to just see what God will do with that. But he, his, his way of doing it is gonna be 100% better than what we would have even come up with. So I just encourage all of you to just tap into that and be ready to listen and to see what's available to you and also reach out. Don't be afraid to reach out. We would love to give you resources. HSLDA is there. And I love that Vicki, you're there right there is that resource as a, a consultant for them. So thank you so much for your time. We're just so thankful to have you. Oh, I've, I've enjoyed. Thank you so much, Maggie.